There is a condition known as thoracic dishing or anterior dishing of the thoracic spine, or it's also known as Pottinger's saucer, name for the physician that first described it. And this is a postural distortion of the thoracic spine where instead of having a normal kyphotic curve of flexion, very often in the mid-thoracic region, the curve reverses. It's not just straight, it's actually reversed. So it's like dropping into a dish. It's actually a lordotic curve of extension in the middle of the thoracic spine. Now, I want to make a point first about this. Thoracic dishing should not be confused with a condition that's known as DISH, which is D-I-S-H, and it stands for Diffuse Idiopathic Skeletal Hyperostosis, and that is a condition of unknown origin, hence idiopathic, in which any joint can be affected, but when the thoracic spine is affected, there's calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. We are speaking about a postural distortion pattern wherein the thoracic spine curve reverses from being kyphotic to being lordotic and what the implications are for manual therapy. So, we have our client Marianne here and very often we work with the person face down, prone, and if we do that and the person has too much extension in the thoracic spine, when we press down, let's just show this for a second without the bolster. Go ahead and lie on down. I'll just put this over here. If she's collapsed down already anteriorly and I'm doing deeper pressure techniques, whether it's working over the musculature, the paraspinal, erector spinae, transverso spinalis, extensor musculature, or any of the forces going directly on the spine. If I'm putting any force from posterior to anterior, P to A here, I could collapse her more anteriorly. And maybe I'll get the benefit of loosening tight musculature, but it will come at the expense of furthering the thoracic dishing, which by putting the spine in more extension will jam the facet joints together more. So can we accomplish the deeper pressure to the myofascial tissues posteriorly here without paying the price? Well, let's figure out what we can do here. We don't want her to collapse too much anteriorly, so let's prevent that. Marianne, let me have you sit up for a sec. I can put a bolster here. Now right now I'm starting with a round bolster that's fairly soft here, and we should also add Marianne does not have this condition, so we're simulating the idea of this. Go ahead and lie on down. Now, the size of the bolster, the firmness of the bolster, the shape of the bolster can vary from one client to another based on what they need, both for comfort and support. But by having a bolster underneath her sternum, effectively, it rounds her more toward flexion. And now when I work into her, it's less likely that I'm going to, assuming that she has the thoracic anterior dishing, it's much less likely that I'm going to collapse her down into more extension because the bolster holds her up toward flexion. Now, this bolster is fairly soft and is not going to give that much resistance this way. Let's show a stronger bolster. So I'll get rid of this one. And here is another one here. And go ahead and lie down on that. And that one might give even more resistance to protect from dropping her into too much extension in the thoracic area when we're working the musculature. Or if we need even more, perhaps, again, you have to make this decision on a client-by-client -client basis. Come on up again. I might put an SOT board, which is a piece of wood with some cushioning and vinyl over it, especially if I feel my table is too soft. And now we're putting the two together. Now be, be aware that this is a lot of support, but therefore a lot of pushing up on the spine. So this might not work for everyone. This might be too much. Again, clinical decision, case by case basis. But now I have even more force pushing up toward flexion to push the spine into flexion and support it there so I can do my soft tissue work to the paraspinal musculature, get the 
benefit of loosening it as I need without having to create more trauma or injury to the spine itself, jamming it into extension, jamming the facet joints. Now, that's a way to simply allow me to do soft tissue manipulation strokes uh, on the paraspinal muscles, but is there something I could do that will actually benefit the client who has this anterior dishing, this extensive extension of the thoracic spine in the middle of it, in the middle of this region here? Yes. I can try to do joint mobilization, grade four, joint mobilization toward flexion. And now I definitely need to have the appropriate bolster firmness to allow for this. So I place my left hand here transversely across your body, my right hand above the left hand. The ulnar side of my left hand finds the spinous process. The groove between the thenar and hypothenar eminences of my right hand, the intereminential groove, finds the very next spinous process and I move them away from each other, opening up toward flexion. This posture of the hands allows me to truly pin and stabilize bone A, and then with my other hand grab bone B, and then move them away from each other. Any other kind of posture like this, there's too much space between my contact hands and I cannot get bone A and B and I have to go across a number of vertebral segments and I cannot isolate the flexion stretching joint mobilization force. So this mobilization toward flexion could actually help someone who has that dishing and extension to open up toward flexion. Now we'll have a close-up where you can better see the contact of my hands for this joint mobilization technique. Now let's look at a close-up of the hand position for this joint mobilization technique into flexion of the thoracic spine. My left hand is transversely across the body and the ulnar side of my left hand finds a spinous process. My right hand goes above my left hand and the groove between the thenar and hypothenar eminences is what I use to contact the spinous process directly above, but if you're more comfortable using your thenar eminence to do that or your hypothenar eminence, that's fine, but I'll show it with the groove here. So I'm on, let's say for the sake of argument, T8. With my left hand, I'm on T7 with my right hand, and I move my hands away from each other to try to open the area up into flexion and having that bolster underneath her, which pushes her toward flexion, predisposes the movement to tension to be able to then stretch the spine into flexion. Now let's have a bit of a close-up with a skeleton so we can see the actual movement of the vertebrae with the plastic skeleton. Now showing a close-up with a plastic skeleton, I have a larger bolster here because it has to simulate that there's the whole thoracic and abdominal pelvic aspect of the human body in front. And you can see that the bolster pushes the person toward flexion. And you can see the opening up of the joints toward flexion when you have this underneath. Now what I'm looking to do, let's say I want to mobilize this joint into flexion. My left hand finds the spinous process of this level. My right hand finds that spinous process directly above, and I open up toward flexion. I literally separate them to create flexion. Then I find the next one, let's say, and the other hand goes to the very next one, and I open up, and I open up toward flexion. And you can just keep going one segmental joint level at a time, opening up the thoracic spine toward flexion a joint mobilization technique for someone that has excessive extension thoracic dishing of the thoracic spine. If you liked this video, know that it is part of our video streaming subscription service. Click the link below for more information and receive a free ebook when you sign up.